and live off my American savings, which go about seven times further in China because China is much poorer and the cost of living here is, is, is a lot lower than it is in the US. And so I did that about two years ago and I, I thought for my new career, because you know, I, I have my father's longevity genes, I think uh, I will probably get to 90. My father's 93, nothing wrong with him. So he may even get to 100, literally. He may, he may be one of the centenarians. So I think I've got his uh, longevity genes. So that means I've got another 20 or 30 years of life left. That's a long time. So um, I was looking around for a word to describe people who conventionally retire and live off their savings and want to do something else, like a, a new career. And I didn't know of such a term, even though there are millions of us doing this now. So I just coined one. And remember, I'm living in China, so I'm a little bit cut off from the Western social scene. So the, the term that I coined is this one. Arc. So, or arcing. So, after retirement careering. So I label myself an arcer. And to contrast an archer with people who are conventionally employed, uh, earning, earning a wage or a salary, I call them wagers. So wagers and archers. And I anticipate the impact on general society of the, the archers will be as significant as the wagers. Uh, in a sense, uh, you, you could split up a normal lifetime into ma three major parts. So. Um, if I label the people involved, so the first third of life, uh, that's that's occupied by the preppers, P R E P, -R -E -P. as as in uh, short for preparation. They they are preparing to become wagers. That's the second third of life. So when you're waging, uh, you are earning a wage or a salary, and then uh, if you save you can then afford to be an archer. You can then retire and then take up another career doing what you personally want. So you're free. You're no longer a wage slave. You know, you're no longer locked in to some task that uh, your employer or organization or whatever uh, pays you to do. So in that sense, you're a kind of wage slave. So if you're an archer, you're then free. So it has enormous attractions. So uh, for my arcing, I decided my new career would be to uh, study to PhD level pure math and math physics. And then uh, the idea occurred to me, well, gosh, um, you know, I'm going to die at some stage, 20, 30 years from now. And if I've absorbed all this knowledge during my arcing phase of life, what a waste if it just rots, as, as my brain rots. So wouldn't it be better to record it? I mean, you know, what a waste if, if, if I don't. So I decided I'd buy myself a camcorder and a tripod and a whiteboard and a pen and just teach this stuff and record it and send it off to, to YouTube so that other people could uh, benefit from, from my own knowledge and my experience as a professor when I was waging. So I have a, oh God, hundreds, thousands? I, I haven't calculated. Uh, you know, the number of classroom lectures that I've given, you know, huge numbers, so a lot of experience. And hopefully I'll be able to bring that to these uh, whiteboard lectures in my living room. So these, these are, in a sense, homegrown lectures. And that, you know, doing things that way offer, offers me uh, enormous freedom. So, uh, so the, the next step was yeah, once I decided that would be my new career, to teach myself PhD level pure math and math physics and a little bit of computer science, uh, the next step was, well, what, what topics would I learn and what topics would I teach? So I started making a list and the list grew and grew and grew. And I may have uh, bitten off too, too much, I may have bitten off, bitten off more than I can chew because uh, that list now, which you'll see on this, on this website here, that list now is almost at 600 courses, graduate level courses. So it's uh, very ambitious. So um, if I do the math, you know, the back of envelope type calculations, it will take me uh, oh, at least a decade, maybe, maybe two, being realistic, to, to get through all this stuff. 
But so, it, in a sense, it's a kind of benefaction. Yeah, down here, um, a benefaction um, uh, from me to to the planet. Because uh, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I'm thinking more about the next generation. When I look around me, virtually everybody I see is younger than I am. So that's just you know <laughs> part of getting older. Okay, so uh, that's more or less who who and what I am now. If you follow these courses and you do the homeworks and you get the textbooks and you, know, you, you do it seriously and you really uh, learn this stuff, do you get any credit for it? Uh, do, you, do you get a piece of paper, a, a diploma, a certificate of some kind? Well, uh, no. <laughs> Not yet. But uh, things happen. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, once these lectures start churning out and being put up on, the, on this website in large numbers, that I will attract a following and maybe even up to about a million people, that's possible if you calculate the number of grad students in departments pure math, math physics and computer science, it, it ballpark more or less a million and there may be several more million people who are just interested, who, who would love this opportunity to just teach themselves because the lectures just have not been uh, up in the past. Although. I need to qualify that to some extent because uh, I've, I've read recently that uh, uh, on YouTube and such like there are now over half a million, 500,000 or so, uh, videoed, you know, camcorded uh, university lectures. Uh, so you know, there's, there's lots to choose from. But what I'm trying to do is a little bit different in the sense it's comprehensive. I mean, think about it, nearly 600 courses. So uh, it covers you know, most of the, the major topics of pure math and math physics. So there's a large number to choose from. And on certain topics, I don't just have like one course, like, like one master's level course on quantum mechanics. No, I'll have like 20, 30, 40. You know, I, I can do that because you know, I'm just putting it up on YouTube. I'm not constrained to, to have just one course on a topic. All right, uh, so I'm hoping that uh, other institutions, uh, maybe companies may even be formed, or universities can adapt themselves to create courses based on these lectures and lectures from other professors. So, so that they can then uh, shrink down, they can, uh, well being blunt, uh, they, they can get rid of the teaching side of their uh, salary load from, from the administrator's point of view. Now if you're a waging professor, uh, you probably feel threatened by what I'm saying, but think of the consequences of you know, this, this kind of thing. Uh, um, now this thing, what, what am I talking about? Well, uh, I've coined a label here, I call it free profing. So I'm a free prof. Free in what sense? Well, in several senses. One, uh, for the student, uh, being able to watch these university lectures is free, right? Because they're on the internet, no no cost involved, and free in the sense of format. Uh, I can do whatever I like. I, I can give a lecture that lasts ten minutes or three hours, right? So I'm free in that sense. Uh, I'm free in the sense I, I can have as many courses on a topic as I, as I want, as I mentioned just before. Stuff like that. Okay, so free in terms of cost and free in terms of format. So I'm a, I'm a free prof and a conventional professor uh, giving a lecture in a classroom at a university, uh, I label a wage prof, right, because that, that professor is waged or, or salaried and uh, much more rigid, like, like a, a lecture lasts a, a fixed amount of time and that lecture takes place at, uh, at a fixed period of the week and the number of lectures in a semester is fixed. So it's all very rigid. So free profing is much, uh, much easier, much freer in that sense. So students can go and watch a video any time of day or night because it's on the internet. Like, like 3 a.m. in the morning and they can't sleep. You can't, I mean, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, you cannot sleep. So you get up and you just study uh, a YouTube lecture, when it, perhaps one of mine or some other professor's lecture. Okay. It's free in that sense. All right. Uh, now I have other motives to to do this stuff, um, not just uh, to 
to take up a new career and, and to teach it. Uh, I, I see what I'm doing also as a means to something higher, a, a, a greater aim, which I call, which I label, uh, <laughs> you'll learn, I like coining words. Uh, uh, when, when I dream up ideas and there's no label for them, I, I just invent the label. So, um, so this, this, this concept that, that I'm interested in, I call it de-dictation. And it's another one of my main motives. Uh, this word, de-dictation, it means to get rid of the last dictatorships on the planet. Uh, one, of, one of my interests, uh, it's not one of my research interests, because it's political science, but definitely one of my interests is something called um, transitology. And that's the study of transitions uh, from what to what from one-party dictatorships to multi-party democracies. Now, I live in China. That's, China is still in the phase, the historical, political phase of uh, one-party dictatorship because it's still too poor. It's not rich enough yet to have made the switch to uh, democracy. But it's getting close. Now, in, uh, in today's world, 2012, there are more or less about 130 democracies in the world. And transitology shows that the planet is democratizing worldwide at the rate, on average, of about two countries per year. So you can extrapolate the trend and predict that within about 40 years there won't be a single dictatorship left. So de-dictation is the concept, the idea, of actively trying to rid the world of its last dictatorships. And one effective way of doing that is to create a much stronger middle class. So that's one of the things I'm hoping to do with these courses, is to educate people to a, a much higher level so that they become uh, more middle class. And once the proportion of a population becomes middle class, that's when the switch from one-party dictatorship to multi-party democracies. That's, that's when it occurs. And empirically, with uh, over a hundred countries, the past half century have made that switch, then um, there's plenty of data for the transitologists, the political scientists and sociologists and so forth, to study. And they notice there's a trend when the standard of living, you know, the, the economic level, uh, goes over six to eight thousand dollars per person per year that's when the switch occurs well China's close and a lot of other countries in the same you know, there's what 70 70 odd still yet to, to make that switch so by attempting to educate the planet to high level I'm doing my bit my contribution towards de-dictation and I see de-dictation as an essential step to an even bigger goal because politically I'm a globist and globism, the ideology, is the idea that uh, humanity should live in a global state, you know, a single government, totally democratic across the whole planet. And then we could get rid of wars, get rid of the arms trade, the great moral abomination of the 21st century. We can get rid of ignorance, get rid of poverty. So getting rid of ignorance is part of what, what this is all about.